Welcome back to our series on Martin Luther and the 95 Thesis and the Protestant Reformation. I'm recording this session from my office in Clayton, New Mexico, because it's early in the morning here and it's quiet and I have the time, so we're going to do it this way because we're still not meeting in person until after the 26th of September. Appreciate your uh, patience with us as we work through not having in-person Bible classes until the little bubble in COVID positive cases seems to subside in our community, but we feel this is best for the membership at, as a whole. So we're going to launch into this uh, and do a little review and then proceed. Recapping a little from last week's lesson, in case you didn't tune in to get you up to speed, the Middle Ages was about a thousand year period from 500 to 1500 AD. During this time, the Catholic Church filled the power gap that happened when the Roman Empire fell. There was no organized structure for administration in Rome, and so the Catholic Church was still as it was before it fell, and so it assumed a natural power gap uh, fulfillment for some kind of leadership and some kind of continuity. The emperor of Rome, Constantine, made Christianity the official state religion, and that promoted a great deal of emphasis on the church until a government could be formed, and so a lot of reliance came to fall to the Catholic Church. The church grew in wealth and power, almost unprecedented amounts of wealth and power compared to anything we've seen in recent times. At one point, the Catholic Church owned a third of the land in Western Europe and all that it produced and all that the people would earn from it as they gave a tithe to the church of approximately 10%. So it became very wealthy, although the peasants lived in, meager, in a very meager life, almost one of austerity and hardly ever moved away from where they grew up. Politics became almost inseparable from religion because there was no administrative power source in Rome. So the Pope kind of became a figurehead. Uh, the emperor had his place. There were armies to be formed and yet somehow they became intertwined to the point that the kings and things didn't want to even pursue anything without the church's blessing. So much so that per Pope Urban II did something unusual. He promised forgiveness of sins both now and in the future if you would fight in the Crusades. And if you're promised eternal life without recourse for anything you do in this mortal life, that was appealing. Even if you thought you might die in the Crusades, you had a guaranteed pass by the Pope to go directly to heaven. And if you survived the Crusades, you could live any way you want because you had a unconditional promise of forgiveness of all your sins, both current and those you're going to commit in the future. That was appealing to many people. The papal authority became unquestioned. He considered himself to be the vicar of Christ, in other words, his representative on earth. And that was unquestioned. Uh, if he spoke what's called, an, I hope I say this correctly, in ex cathedra, that may not be the right word. But if he speaks on behalf of the church, on behalf of God, then no one can question that statement. It is unconditional. The first pope is Leo I at least according to history, and he comes along in 440 AD. No record of what happens between Peter, if he was the first Pope of the Catholic Church, as they allege, no word of who was the Pope for the intervening 400 years. That seems odd to me that if you have a system of a church that there's no records of who led the church for four uh, centuries. That, that's just kind of hard to understand. But anyway, Leo I is recorded as the first pope in 440. The Catholic religion also teaches that the pope doesn't marry, but we know from scripture that Peter did if he was the first pope. 
We know he had a wife and he had a mother-in-law. So you can't have those without having been married. The Catholic Church also is heavy on the worship of Mary, more so than probably most people outside the Catholic Church realize. They believe that she maintained her virginity for life and that the brothers of Jesus mentioned in scriptures are from another woman also named Mary, who's married to Joseph, uh, that being Mary Cloopus. There's nothing in the Bible text that will support that marriage or that she had those children. But the text does, as we mentioned last week and showed chapter and verse, plainly list them and calls them is this not Mary, his mother, and are not these his brothers, and names them. In another place, it says, I didn't see any other apostles, but I saw this one, James, and uh, the, the Lord's brother. They also believe that she's an intercessor on the throne in heaven. They pray to her for forgiveness of sin and for those sorts of things. And we know from Scripture that the only intercessor is Jesus Christ. The prayers to Mary are labeled and given names as the Hail Mary, which really is in three parts, and later a fourth part was added, and we'll look briefly at that for just a moment. We're also going to mention briefly at this in this closing of this recap about rosary beads. I don't fully understand them. I do have a document which I will give to the class when we assemble in person that shows you step by step of how you do or perform the rosary, how you use the beads and what's supposed to happen. So we'll look at that. Now here is the Hail Mary in text form. It's Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. That's the first statement that was made. Then was added, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And that is a quote from what um, was said whenever Jesus' mother was visited by her. I've got that messed up in my mind all of a sudden. That second statement made by Elizabeth when she comes to visit Mary and she makes that statement. And then the next one is, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. So that's the full Hail Mary that's used in today's world. It was at one time in those different parts, but now that's the complete one. This is a diagram of the rosary bead. You have the cross there in, near the bottom, and you start with that and you say what's known as the Apostles' Creed. Then at the first bead, you say what's a phrase known as Our Father. The next three beads are three Hail Marys. Then the next large bead, you say a glory be. And when you get to the bead, you say another Our Father. And you follow on around. We're not going to go into that because the paper I'll give you will explain how you do that. But it's very specific and each bead represents something you're supposed to say. Um, so we'll deal with that at a future time. So that brings us to the subject of purgatory, which I think we touched on briefly, but I wanted to go through it again because it's such an important part of what Martin Luther gets involved with in his concept of how do you get out of purgatory, the concept of indulgences, uh, and we'll look at some definitions of those words. But the Catholic Church teaches that a Christian soul must burn in purgatory after death until all of their sins have been purged before they can go on to heaven. So this concept, if something's burning in purgatory, that sounds uncomfortable to my mind. And it is something you wouldn't want your loved ones to suffer, nor would you look forward to suffering it yourself. So it's not a peaceful place. It's a place of being punished for your sins in this life until some threshold is passed by which you can go on to heaven. But to speed up this purging process, you could pay money to a priest, and that's what's called an indulgence. You could buy an indulgence so that he could pray and have special masses for an earlier release for your loved one from purgatory to go on to heaven. This practice began creeping into the Roman church during the reign of Pope Gregory around the end of the sixth century. So indulgences didn't always exist. They came along as a means to uh, speed up someone's release. And also, 
to make a certain amount of additional money for the church. I don't want that to sound as crass as it probably sounded, but you'll see in a little bit where a plot is actually hatched between two people, primarily to raise money. And if it helped people get out of purgatory, so much the better. But there's no scriptural support for the concept of purgatory. None at all. Even the story of the rich man Lazarus, uh, you don't get a concept that you're going to get prayed into or out of anything. You're just in a condition that describes the two. But Psalms 49 speaks to that concept. It may not have been speaking directly toward indulgences, but it made the comment that a person couldn't redeem a loved one even if such a place did exist, because here's the quote from the verses. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom. So that may not have been aimed directly at indulgences, but it certainly talks that you can't take money and boast about your riches and by any means redeem your brother nor give God a ransom for him. So that's, to me, that's what it does. It sounds like you're ransoming, you're buying your way out of purgatory. And here in Psalms, it says that's not possible. So we're moving on to the Mass. The Mass is actually, from our point of view, from the rest of Christendom, a perversion of the Christian practice of the Lord's Supper as described in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, and in 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27. It's not that the elements themselves are questioned. It's the purpose of them that is at odds. And this is one of the stumbling points and problems that Martin Luther had with the Catholic religion as he studied. The Catholic Church created the Mass, and they say they believe this is a continual sacrifice of Jesus Christ, an actual sacrifice. Here's a quote. Christ commanded that his bloody sacrifice on the cross should be daily renewed by an unbloody sacrifice of his body and blood in the mass under the simple elements of bread and wine. That's taken from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 10, page 13, in an article, Mass, the Sacrifice of. Jesus never made such a command. Again, you can read Matthew 26 and 1 Corinthians 11 and see that for yourself. The Lord's Supper is a memorial and a showing of his death until he comes. That's in the text of those passages. It's not a sacrifice. It never says it's a sacrifice. It never implies it's a sacrifice. Not a continual one, anyway. It's a remember the sacrifice that was made once and for all. Not that we're going to keep that sacrifice going on and on and on. It was once and forever. The Catholic Encyclopedia states the following. In the celebration of the Holy Mass, the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ. And they mean physically changed. They don't mean metaphorically. This is called transubstantiation, where the sacrament of the Eucharist and the substance of the bread and wine do not remain, but the entire substance of the bread is changed into the body of Christ. An actual physical transformation of bread into the body of Christ and wine into the blood of Christ. It also says, and the entire substance of the wine is changed into his blood. The species or outward semblance of the bread and wine alone remains. That's from volume four, page 277 of an article called Consecration. The Catholic Church teaches that the Holy Mass is a literal eating and drinking of the literal flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. They claim the priest has the power to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. What does God's word say about that? Well, Genesis 9:4. I know it's Old Testament, but there's a command there. You must not eat meat that has lifeblood in it. It's talking about blood. If this becomes literal flesh and blood, then we should be looking at commands that talk about, can you drink blood? Can you eat blood in its raw form? 
Genesis 9, 4, you should not eat meat that's got lifeblood still in it. Leviticus 17, the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It's the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Therefore, I say to the Israelites, none of you may eat blood, nor may any foreigner residing among you eat blood. So there's a direct command not to eat blood. Old Testament to be sure, but wait. What about Acts, New Testament? 15 verse 29. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. So here you have a direct statement about blood. God absolutely forbids the drinking of blood all throughout the Bible, or eating of blood. I guess eating and drinking could be considered one and the same. Rome teaches that the math is a continual sacrifice. God's word says that Jesus made the final sacrifice at Calvary. Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 12. By the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Not every week, or not every time, not every anything, but one time. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sin forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So it's done. That sacrifice is through. One sacrifice for sin, how long? Forever. What about image worship? The Catholic religion is filled with all sorts of symbols, images, and relics. The Catechism of the Council of Trent states these words, It is lawful to have images in the church and to give honor and worship unto them. Very plainly, the church endorses images and honoring and worshiping them. Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5 says, though, you shall not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water underneath the earth. No graven image. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. It couldn't be much plainer. No graven images. And yet the Old Testament is replete with Baal and Asherah poles over and over and over and over. It's amazing how God made it so plain. Even in the Ten Commandments structure, you shall in no other gods before me. What about salvation by works? Things like infant baptism, keeping sacraments, church membership, going to the mass, praying to Mary, confession, just to, just to name a few. The Catholic Church has a system of salvation through works. God's word says we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not through works. Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works. Why? Lest any man should boast. So here you have a conflict. Salvation by works or salvation by grace through faith. And this is one of the major things that Martin Luther wanted to discuss with his thesis, his 95 thesis he nailed on the castle church door at Wittenberg. He wanted to discuss indulgences primarily, and he wanted to discuss how you're saved. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. His faith is counted, not his works, his faith. Now, faith, is it going to lead to works? I think so, but let's be sure you've got the, the motivation for the work correct. You did it because of your faith, not for the reward. And, and I, that sometimes may be complicated to grasp, but he counted his faith as righteousness. So, 
Martin Luther here comes to some definitions, or not Martin Luther, but we're going to look at some definitions here. One word is detraction. That means to reveal another sentence to a third party who does not need to know about them. To me, this would be similar to the confession to a, to a priest in this setting, at least talking about the Catholic Church. You tell another sentence to a third person who doesn't need to know about it. It's not his business, but that's a word we'll look at. Laity, members of a society who remain where they were placed by baptism. We don't see that much in the Protestant world, but it's pretty popular, I understand, in the Catholic world. The clergy are people who've been raised by ordination to a higher class, and they're placed in the sacred hierarchy. So this is a ranking system, if you will, a position of importance and power. There's something called a papal bull. It's not something we encounter in modern language or in modern time, but it's a formal proclamation or letter that's issued by the Pope. It was usually written in antiquated characters, very ornate, and it would be sealed with something called lead bulla, hence the word bull. And since it's from the Pope, it becomes papal, so it's papal proclamation sealed with a lead seal. So a papal bull would be an official document of the Catholic Church. Indulgences. This could be to grant either full or partial remission of punishment of sin. And is the big thrust of what got Martin Luther in trouble because we'll see later how that played out. The granting of an indulgence was predicated on two beliefs. So there's two parts. First, in the sacrament of penance, it did not suffice to have the guilt of sin forgiven through absolution alone. One also needed to undergo temporal punishment, a penance, because one had offended Almighty God. Second, indulgences rested on the belief in purgatory, which is a place in the next life where one could continue to cancel the accumulated debt of one's sins before going on to heaven. It's as if you have a, a balance sheet, you have credits and debits, that you've done good things, you've done bad things. And if the bad things outweigh the good things, then you stay in purgatory until there are enough good things said, done, prayed about, or whatever that process is, to balance the scales and make things about you that are good as many as the things that were bad. And at that point, then you can go on to heaven. I'm not certain if this word should be pronounced diet like we have food or diet. Either way, the one at the town of, it looks like worms, but it's in German, the W's are pronounced V's. So the diet of Worms of 1521 was an imperial diet, which was an assembly meeting of the Holy Roman Empire. All the princes of the region would gather and would gather judgment, pronounce judgment. It was a very formal assembly. And it was a big deal because if they called a diet, you were required to come. Not only that, you had to travel considerable distance, either by foot or horse or donkey or something, and spend a great deal of time and effort to attend. These were usually convened to determine how authorities, both political and religious, would respond to something. In this case, it was specifically about Martin Luther's teachings. It's interesting that one man, uh, one monk would cause such a stir that the entire church would decide to call a meeting of all the princes of the Roman Empire together to discuss his teachings. And this diet was held in Worms, pronounced, as I mentioned there, Worms in Germany. So now we're going to look at his life and the events that led to his to the Reformation. Martin Luther's born on November the 10th, 1483. His parents are Hans and Margaretha. Hans was a common servant, but he worked in a copper mine and eventually worked his way up to own a mine and a smelter. So he became one of the, one of the wealthy people. Hans was driven to succeed and he was driven to be sure that his son, Martin, would also succeed. 
So he enrolls Martin at the University of Erford to study law, to become a lawyer. That's what he wanted for his son. Well, Martin Luther does enter into ministry. But around the age of 21, he's caught in a thunderstorm, apparently a terrible thunderstorm with lots of lightning, and alleged he prayed, help me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. Uh, to me, this is almost like a foxhole religion thing. Says, dear God, please, if you'll save me, and I'll do X, Y, or Z, if you'll just get me out of this foxhole alive. Well, here he's caught in the open somewhere in a thunderstorm, and if he makes a similar appeal, he thinks he's going to die in the thunderstorm, and says, if you'll, if you'll save me here, uh, I'll, I'll become a monk. I'll change. I won't be a lawyer. Well, true to his word, he survives and he enters the Augustinian Monastery in 1505 and his dad wasn't very pleased about it, as you might imagine. His dad wanted to be a lawyer. What do you mean you want to be a monk? Well, he made a, a pledge to St. Anne and he kept it. So he's ordained a priest and he studies theology in preparation to become a teacher. Not a school teacher, but in the, in the monasteries and, the, and teach uh, Bible and canon law. Well, Martin Luther becomes consumed with the concept of confession. He's tormented by a sensitivity to sin. He goes to something called extreme asceticism. This talks about extreme prayer, extreme fast, extreme sleep deprivation, cold, whipping himself. Uh, he went far beyond what most people would consider normal behavior in order to be relieved of sin. He was said to be constantly in confession. Luther's even said, if, I, if ever a monk got to heaven by his monkery, then I was that monk. Martin Luther goes to Rome. The abbot, Stoppitz, sends Luther on a pilgrimage to Rome. Now, Rome's not next door. He's in Germany. It's 881 miles from where he is to Rome. And that includes going over the Alps. The Alps are not foothills. They're higher, higher than the Rocky Mountains. And He's on foot, or on a donkey, or perhaps a horse. 800 miles, one way. That's about the same distance from Amarillo to Las Vegas, Nevada, which is 861 miles. Just look at this map of how far he went. He goes from way up there in the north, just south of Berlin, all the way down in Italy to Rome. And he has to cross the Alps there near Switzerland as he goes there. By comparison for distance, this is a map of Amarillo to Las Vegas. And those of you who have ever driven west will be familiar with that route. That's tough enough to do in a car. I just can't imagine saying, OK, I think we'll walk to Las Vegas. I have no idea how long that took, but it wasn't quick nor was it going to be easy. While he's in Rome, he visits some of the holy uh, places. He crawls up Pilate's staircase. I should probably look up a picture of Pilate's staircase. It's available. It's fairly steep. It's a little wider than you might think. I'm, I'm guessing from memory of my picture of that, about five, six feet wide. But people crawl up the staircase on their knees, and on every step they say the Hail Mary. Allegedly, Luther did the same. He observed while he's there that the priests and bishops are acting immorally and abusing their power. Now, there's no, no, I could not find anything that explained what he saw that he would consider immoral and abusing, but apparently enough that it disturbed him that he saw people behaving in a manner he thought they should not for the position they held. Enough so that he said to, I went with onions and I returned with garlic. And you can make of that what you please, but it sounded like he went 
uh, with one concept and came back with another. Well, <laughs> you got to remember, he has to walk 800 miles back. I, I just think that's a long trip, especially if you've been a little delu delusioned with what you saw when you were in Rome. You saw people of church influence behaving what he would probably consider badly, and yet nothing was done that he could see. So Stoppitz now sends him to Wittenberg to be a professor of theology, to teach. That's what he trained to do. Well, in 1515, he makes the great discovery, he calls it. Now, this verse has been there all along, Romans 117. But when you and I study, I think from time to time, we stumble across a verse that's been there all the time, and we finally see it in a different light or make note of it and uh, make almost like it's revolution, revelation to us, like, wow, I, has that been there the whole time? Well, that's what happens to, here to Martin Luther. <clears throat> this verse says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. And when Martin read that, he concluded, The righteous man shall live by faith only. That's important. He believes righteousness by faith only. The King James Version just says, the just shall live by faith. And again, he wants to add the word only, Martin Luther does, because that's what he believes the text to say. And that the gospel is a revelation of justice of God. And here's his quote. He said, here I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through gates that had been flung open. The whole of scripture gained a new meaning. And from that point on, the phrase, quote, the justice of God, end quote, no longer filled me with hatred, but rather became unspeakably sweet by virtue of a great love. So if you read that quote, Martin Luther saw the justice of God as something bad or, or fearful because it, it no longer filled me with hatred. But the justice of God was now a virtue of great love. So he went from a punitive thought of the justice of God to a reward because of the justice of God. And to him, that was revolutionary. The justice of God had been unbearable, and yet the gospel was linked to God's justice. So he struggled between those two concepts. Justice does not refer to punishment of sinners. Righteousness is given to those who live by faith. When we say criminal justice system, what comes to your, our minds? We think crime and punishment. But justice in God's sight is, can be either punishment or reward. We don't see reward in the criminal justice system of man. So it's hard for us to give, have a concept of God whose justice is to reward those who diligently seek him. We sometimes struggle with that. Justification is the three, free gift of God to sinners. Righteousness is imputed by God who justifies humans by their faith in Jesus Christ. So how are we justified? We're justified by faith, but not of not how we believe, but our faith in what we believe, in this case, faith in Jesus. So is it faith only? Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Think of that again. That word impossible is a big word. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. So if you don't have faith, you're not going to be able to please him. That's what that verse says. He goes, continues though, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So we must have belief and faith in that process. Luke 5, 20, seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. But when did he say that? If faith alone is going to save, here it is, a verse that says your sins are forgiven you because he saw their faith. You got to remember that was written when it was still under the old covenant law. Jesus hadn't died yet. 
He forgave sins. No problem. Luke 7, 50, he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, it's still under the old covenant law. James 2, 14 through 26, discusses the relationship between faith and works. The 24th verse in that passage says, you see then that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now, this is the only place in uh, most New Testament Bibles where you have faith only mentioned as words together. And they are uh, they're such that it, it's not by faith only. I mean, uh, those who want to justify the concept of living by faith only haven't seen the verses. It is not by faith only. So anyway, faith and works is a complicated structure and sometime we probably should discuss it in more depth. So then becomes the controversy over the indulgences. Leo X sold the position of Archbishop of Mans to Albert of Brandenburg, and he did it to raise money to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So this is where you get the first, I don't want to say devious because that sounds like it's dishonest, but you get it an emphasis put on selling of indulgences to raise money for the Catholic Church. In this case, Leo wants to build a magnificent edifice, which he does start. He doesn't get to finish it, but he gets it started. And it's the St. Peter Basilica you would go to see in Rome today if you were to go. I've seen photographs within that facility, and it is amazing. It is absolutely awesome to see it. Uh, wealth unimaginable to build it. But he needed the money to do it. So part of the money is he got Albert of Brandenburg to buy the archbishopship to Mance. So what does Albert do to raise to pay off the Pope? I mean, he's he's bought he's bought this position, but how does he raise enough money to fund that? He hires a man named John Tessel to sell indulgences. So he's going to get his money from the sale of indulgences to pay Leo X the price of becoming the archbishop. So much so that Tetzel and his efforts to sell indulgences coined a term as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Kind of a catchy catchphrase if you're a pitch man. Uh, Luther wasn't against the sale of indulgences per se. I mean, he thought the concept was pretty good, but what got him upset was he was against the fire and brimstone preaching that the dead were suffering in purgatory and that his indulgence would shorten their time. In other words, guilt and shame people into buying indulgences for their relatives or their friends that have passed on. It's terrible to think that your loved one might be living in pain and anguish and you could do something for it. All you had to do is pay the priest some money, right? Well, that sounds simple, but let's check a little further. Indulgences were not cheap. You didn't go buy a $5 indulgence. Often as much as a half a year's wage was the price of an indulgence. You stop and think about that a second. I don't know what you make in a calendar year, but let's just pick a number out of thin air. Let's say you make $50,000. Well, the price of indulgence in that case is 25,000. Can you live on half of your year's wage comfortably? It would be difficult. So the church raised enormous amounts of money. It wasn't a, small, a bunch of small indulgences. They were expensive. So the people began to say, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the Pope gets richer still. Kind of twisted it on him. Now, this title is not a misprint. It says the 97 Thesis. I thought we were going to be discussing the 95 Thesis. Well, the 97 Thesis was written one or two years before the 95. And there's a reason there's a big difference in the two. What, scholar, what he wanted to do was have a scholarly debate about the practices of the, of the Catholic Church, specifically about indulgences and about faith and works 
and a few other specific subjects. But in the 97th thesis, he didn't bring those up. These contained more questions about general doctrine than the 95 thesis did. And they were largely ignored. The nine, most people don't even know the 97 thesis was written. I can provide you with a written copy of it. It's not difficult to read. It's just 97 statements. So the 95 thesis, though, is written against the sale of indulgences. He nails it to the door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg on October the 31st, 1517. It's translated and printed into normal, into regular German. I think he probably wrote it in Latin and put it on the door. It's translated then into German. And because Gutenberg has invented the printing press at this same period of time, it is now reprinted and it's distributed all over Germany within two weeks. Apparently this was a lightning rod thing. Martin didn't set out to overturn the Catholic Church. That was not his purpose. He was a scholar. He wanted to discuss, have a debate, have a discussion in open forum about various practices of the church. Were they right? Were they wrong? What could be done? Not let's turn over the church. Let's just discuss some of these things. I don't see where scripture and what we're doing match. He's disturbed by the practices of the church in opposition to what he was reading in scripture. And so the purpose then was to promote a scholarly discussion about the points contained therein as an academic exercise of scholarship. The preamble to the 95 Thesis invites people who couldn't come in person to respond in writing about their position on the propositions he's written. So he just wants uh, XYZ people who are in the church say, here, what do you think of these thoughts? Send me your thoughts. Let's, let's discuss this. And posting a note on the door apparently was a common messaging system. It wasn't like nobody had ever nailed anything on the door. It was almost a bulletin board. But you almost have to also realize that the common person was illiterate. So why he posted it there, I'm not exactly sure. No one seems to know, but he did. And it took off like lightning. We could look at a selection from the 95 thesis, but I think we're going to stop there. And we'll resume at this point when we have our next class. Uh, perhaps that will be in person. If not, we'll try to do this video format once again. Uh, thank you for tuning in to watch. I hope you're finding this information interesting, uh, educational, thought-provoking, and helps us with our understanding of what we believe and why we believe what we believe, and whether or not we're looking to Scripture for actual authority for what we do. Let's end this class with a prayer. Father, thank you for the time we can be together. Thank you for the opportunity of electronic media that lets us still study even though we're separate. We thank you for people like Martin Luther who brought to light that things that man were doing were not in exact lockstep with what scripture was teaching. Help us to also be courageous and to take a stand where we see things that we believe are not in keeping with your word. Be with those that are sick, be with those that are hurting. Forgive us our wrongs and watch over us until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching and good night.